Welcome to the OCC Podcast. Whether you're listening to this at home, on the road, at work, or in the gym, we're so glad you decided to join us as we study God's Word together. We hope and pray that through this ministry, you will grow in your relationship with God as well as become a chair for disciple maker. But for now, sit back and let us help you see how the Bible applies to your life today. Dare to be a Daniel. That's what we're going to talk about today. Surprise. <laughs> hey, first, I want to give a shout out of thanks to the folks that helped out with Vacation Bible School this past week. We had VBS here at OCC, and we had a great time. Kids enjoyed it. I, I think most of the adults enjoyed it. But I did, anyway. Had water day on Thursday. Got a little wet. Wasn't quite warmed up yet, though. But uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun still. So if you get a chance next summer, if you get some time off, or we even got adults that take vacation week, um, and just so they can volunteer at VBS. So it can be a lot of fun. So give it some thought for next year. Yeah, it's kind of like Awana, only compressed into one week. So it's great. It's great. So thanks for joining us here uh, and online to learn about God's Word and the application it has in our lives today. So let's pray before we jump into this. Father God, we just thank you so much uh, for who you are, uh, for your sovereignty and uh, the control that you ultimately want over our lives so that we can serve you in the best way possible. Uh, we pray that uh, hearts would be open and, and uh, uh, to hear this message that you've uh, given through me. And uh, I pray that we would, you would give me the right words and uh, that it would mean um, something to somebody that maybe needs to take a, uh, a step in faith for you. So be with us and take us through this week. In your name we pray, amen. All right, life can be a roller coaster. There's ups and downs and curves and all sorts of twists and turns that you, you don't control. But however, the roller coaster is still headed to its designed end. It's always going to come back to that same starting point, so you know what the designed end is. We like having a sense of control over our lives, but control really is just an illusion. All it takes is one bad doctor report, uh, a rebellious child, a car wreck, a pandemic, a misfiled report, or a downturn in the job market to reveal just how little control we have over our lives. Where our control ends is where we find the joy and the faithfulness of God. While life may seem like a roller coaster at times, God is bringing us to his desired end. His faithfulness will see us through. What we need is a strong conviction in the faithfulness of God, who is the one who is really in control. When I learned up to give up my illusion of control and truly trust God, I find that I can enjoy the ride more. I don't mean that all your troubles will simply go away, but what I do mean is that when I have a strong confidence in God, bringing the right of my life to his desired end, I can relax and I can enjoy the ride more. Are you holding on to the safety bar of life with clenched fists, terrorized by your own lack of control? Or do you let go and embrace the truth that God is using all the ups and the downs to bring you to his desired end? So this month, we're teaching in the first chapter of the book of Daniel, and we'll be learning about his strong confidence in God. Last week, James gave us a little history and a, and a good lesson on the sovereignty of God. And I'll continue to build on that today. The prophet Daniel lived in the 6th century before the birth of Jesus. During this approximate period, construction began on the Acropolis in Athens. The Mayan civilization flourished in Mexico. Aesop wrote his fables. Confucius and Buddha lived. Greek art began to truly excel. The Greeks introduced the olive tree to Italy. I had no idea until I did this research. And, then, and the Phoenicians made the first known sea journey around Africa. The power of Babylon came from its ability to yield death, to wield death. Nebuchadnezzar used exile to kill Daniel's nation and executions to make his captives comply. 
You remember last week that James pointed this out as a true definition of a dictator. But despite how it appeared, God was always in control. Just as Daniel rose in power in Babylon, Jesus rose in power from the grave, as we can read in Ephesians chapter 1. Babylon could not overturn God's plan to preserve an exiled people. Neither could the power of Rome, nor the exile of the grave, overturn God's plan to raise Jesus from the dead and seat him in power, as we see in Acts chapter 2, verses 23 and 24. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Unlike the empires of the world, God's power rests in his ability to undo death. The message of Daniel and of Jesus is the same. Despite how it looks, God is in control. Let's remember a bit of context in this book. We're in the Old Testament, which means the events in this book were written and recorded hundreds of years before the life of Jesus. This book would have been included in the Bible that Jesus and his apostles read. If you recall, Daniel was a descendant of King David in the Old Testament, which made him a cultural elite in ancient Israel. As seen last week in Daniel chapter 1, verse 3, it says where they were to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles. Israel had been attacked by a new world empire, known as Babylon. Daniel, along with others from Israel, were taken by force from Jerusalem to Babylon to live as refugees. And so this young teenager, Daniel, finds himself suddenly immersed in Babylonian pagan culture. He's given a new Babylonian name. He's taught new Babylonian literature. Daniel and his three close friends are placed in a cultural immersion program by King Nebuchadnezzar. The idea was that if Nebuchadnezzar could inculcate the cultural elite then and make them Babylonians, the rest would follow. In today's passage, Daniel continues in his cultural immersion program in Babylon. And we discover when and how Daniel drew a line in the sand of what he was and was not willing to do while living in Babylon. Every Christian must determine between them and God where they draw the line in the sand. So let's read this first portion of our text today in the book of Daniel, chapter 1, verses 8 through 16. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you are in worse conditions than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what they see. So he listened to them in this matter and he tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. So this passage begins with David resolving in his heart not to defile himself by eating the king's food. The word here translated as defile himself carries the idea of making oneself ceremonially unclean. Daniel living before the days of Jesus was bound by all the Old Testament law, including specific kosher food laws of what he could and could not eat. It very well may have been the case that Daniel was concerned about the food from the king's table because it was not prepared according to these laws. And therefore, it would have been a sin for him to eat the food. 
For all he knew, the fried asparagus had been fried in pork grease. It would have been breaking God's law to eat and enjoy such food. But we also noticed that he resolved not to drink the wine, which was not included in the kosher food laws. Which means there was some type of a, some kind of a spiritual fast taking place here. Certainly the law was at play, but Daniel's aim is to go further than the law and set himself apart as a follower of God. This arg- arguably was some sort of a semi-fast, not from all food, but from an, enough that he could remember come every meal that he belonged to God and not to the king of Babylon. Notice Daniel's first move. Once he's decided in his heart not to participate in sin, he asks his boss if he can be permitted to not to participate in the royal buffet every day. This is an important component. As Daniel's first move is not to flip tables. His first move is not to stage a protest. His first move is not to shoot off an angry tweet using hashtag tyranny. His first move is to humbly make a request. And we'll come back to that point later. Look at verse 9. It says, God gave Daniel favor and compassion. And this is critical. We spend so much of our time worrying about how people are going to respond to any number of circumstances and we forget that we serve a mighty God. God is able to open doors and soften hearts. This is all, in all reality the great theme of all the book of Daniel and specifically the primary lesson of today's text. The lesson for us focuses not primarily on how we behave as we follow Daniel. That's a fine lesson and we'll get there. However, the first and primary lesson is that God is orchestrating history according to his will. And that he has a way of making paths forward for faithful followers that we might never have imagined were possible. Moving on to verse 10, it says, So you would endanger my head with the king. The chief of the eunuchs responds with a good point. He essentially says to Daniel, Daniel, I like you, but if you don't get, eat the food and you get sick and you waste away, I'll get killed for it. Again, Daniel has a gracious and very wise response. He says to the chief of the eunuchs, test us. Let us eat our own food for 10 days and see how we look. If we look sick, then let's talk about next steps then. But if we look healthy, then there's no risk to you at all. The steward agrees to the plan. Again, please notice the winsomeness first step. Daniel is doing all he can to honor God and honor the circumstances that God has placed him in. His aim is not to recklessly make enemies. His aim is to demonstrate godliness in every situation. And God honors this profoundly. We're told in verse 15, At the end of the ten days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. See how God honors Daniel's desire? Daniel has resolved in his heart to honor God and not sin. Many Christians today have not learned the wisdom of Daniel to hold a conviction and work to see a way forward. I think there's at least three different approaches that modern Christians often take in these situations. First, some are like chameleons whose aim is to blend in. Even when the word of God is at stake, we say, this is not the place to draw the line. Second, others are pure fighters whose first move all the time is, Lines crossed, let's fight. There's a time and a place to flip tables. But you'll notice Jesus did not resort to flipping tables at every juncture. Third, still others are clueless. They've never developed the will or the ability to recognize that Babylon is not a neutral kingdom, but in reality is a kingdom in opposition to God. The clueless person says, Babylon's a pretty great place. So Daniel and his friends are none of these. They're resolved in their heart to honor God, yet behave courageously and kindly in their first efforts at moving forward in a difficult situation, and they're utterly reliant on God. Now, a fun factoid shows up in verse 16. It says, So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. 
So what happened here? Ashpenaz and his servant certainly would have not requested the daily meal delivery stop since this information would have gotten back to Nebuchadnezzar very quickly and not in a good way, not, not with a good response. So I'm thinking just maybe their own families ate like kings for about three years. Not a bad deal all the way around, right? Let's read on in the remainder of chapter 1, verses 17 through 21. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of the time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them, and among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. So in these verses, we see what happens as a result of Daniel's faithfulness to his God in this trying circumstance. He not only grows in favor with his peers, but he works diligently in the circumstances. He studies hard. And by the time all, of the, all the attendees of the king's enculturalization program are presented to Nebuchadnezzar, none of the youth can match Daniel and his three friends in wisdom and understanding. And because of Daniel's senior, senior rank in the Babylonian courts, he would eventually be a primary cause in the conversion of King Nebuchadnezzar himself to faith in the God of the Bible. But that's not for a few more chapters. Additionally, we'll learn that Daniel remained until the first year of King Cyrus, when Daniel would have been 80 years old and had served in the court for three kings. Although he was not literally a free man, he became a respected and powerful leader during the 70 years his people were in captivity in Babylon. His sp spiritual and political influence was enormous. Let's begin to transition from the text to our own lives and how we can think about applying this meaningfully into our own times. Like Daniel, we are li living in Babylon. That term Babylon is used throughout the rest of the Bible to describe godless systems and governments. So when we say that as Christians, we're living in Babylon, the idea means we are much like Daniel. We're living as Christians in a society that does not treasure the God of the Bible and in all actuality is often hostile to the God of the Bible. We're living in a society like Babylon that has constructed strange gods to worship. And the worship of those strange gods will drive your value systems. Pastor and author Tim Keller is quoted as saying, there are good things of this world, the hard things of this world, and there's the best things of this world, God's love and glory and holiness and beauty. The Bible's teaching is that the road to the best things is not through the good things, but it's usually through the hard things. There is no message more contrary to the way the world understands life or more subversive to its values. The challenge for Christians is the same challenge Daniel had. As citizens of, in Babylon, where do we bend and where do we draw the, a line in the sand? I read another person state it this way. He said, how should Christians relate to an increasingly de-Christianized public square? where people are becoming either ignorant or hostile towards the worldview of the Bible. Where are Christians, what are Christians to do when the institutional church is marginalized, the exclusive claims of the gospel are viewed as bigotry, and the moral law in scripture is seen as repressive and intolerant? From Daniel, we learn a few important principles to apply while living in Babylon. First, Babylon is not neutral. Many people, Christians and non-Christians alike, imagine that modern secular culture we live in is somehow morally and religiously neutral. There is no neutrality. The Christian, like Daniel, must resolve in his heart 
not to defile himself. To be a Christian is to choose to follow Jesus as your Lord. It's to live with ultimate submission to God's authority alone. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. In other words, there's no such thing as spiritual Switzerland. You cannot serve two masters. And the attempt to sit in a mythological neutral zone is in fact an attempt to stand against Jesus. Again, Keller says, when you come to Christ, you must drop your conditions. You have to give up the right to say, I will obey you if, I will do this if. As soon as you say, I will obey you if, that's not obedience at all. You're saying, you're my advisor, not my Lord. I'll be happy to take your recommendations. And I might even do some of them. No. If you want Jesus with you, you have to give up the right to self-determination. Self-denial is an act of rebellion against our late modern culture of self-assertion. But that's where, what we're called to do, nothing less. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through th- uh, 27, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like the wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rains fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Hear the clarity of Christ. Build your life upon my word or you're a fool and your world will crash down around you. As Christians, we must protect against the tendency to make Jesus' divisive language less divisive. I'll say that again. As Christians, we must protect against the tendency to make Jesus' divisive language less divisive. According to Jesus, there are two foundations for life with two absolute different destinations. Even the person who is ambivalent towards Jesus or perhaps has not made a choice for Jesus by virtue of not yet making a choice is in the default position of having built their life on sand. Hear him. Build your life upon my word or you are a fool and your world will crash down around you. This applies personally first and corporately second. Individually, we are saved by grace through faith. Every one of us are born rebels to God. The only method ever made to forgive humanity for their sins is Jesus' death and resurrection. The gospel of Jesus is the only rock to build your life upon. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Second principle, God's word is our standard. Here we answer the question, how do we know when to draw a line in the sand? The answer is whenever Babylon attempts you to get you to do something or believe something that contradicts God's word, the line gets drawn in the sand. Daniel was willing to bend a lot while living in Babylon. Daniel was willing to take a new Babylonian name. Why? Well, that technically didn't break any of God's laws. It probably was not his favorite thing in the world, but he was able to separate his preferences from God's ultimate standard. Daniel was willing to go along with his pagan education, even though he knew much of what they were teaching about false gods was patently false and not true. When did Daniel draw a line in the sand? Daniel's line was when Babylon asked him to do something that was in direct contradiction to God's word. To eat the food from the king's table would have likely been sinful. In order to apply this principle properly, you must know God's word. If you don't know and treasure God's word, then you'll never know when the culture around you 
is asking you to do something that will break God's word. Contemporary people tend to examine the Bible looking for things they cannot accept. But Christians should reverse that, allowing the Bible to examine us looking for things God can't accept. We hate sin because we, live, we love God. The Babylon we now live in loves many of the things God hates and hates many of the things God loves. On these issues, we cannot be chameleons. A Christian is willing to live in Babylon. They're willing to walk the streets of Babylon and to shop in the stores in Babylon, to buy homes in Babylon, to make friends in Babylon, to raise kids in Babylon. It's not a sin to live in Babylon. But when Babylon asks us to normalize sin, to celebrate sin, to teach sin to our children, we resist. As the great reformer Martin Luther so famously said, here I stand, I can do no other. Principle three is that when we must draw a line in the sand, we always first attempt to do so graciously. There's something about the seeds of America that has developed a culture of people who love rebellion. Literally, rebellion is kind of in the blood of America. We were born out of rebellion. Sometimes I watch American Christians engage in honest attempts to resist Babylon's pressures, and they manage to skip steps one, two, three, four, and five of diplomacy, and they jump straight into wholesale revolution. If you look to Daniel, when he was asked to cross a line in the sand, his first response was to gently ask his boss if another way could be found. When his boss didn't like that idea, Daniel kept thinking, how can I respectfully find a way to work this? Daniel didn't want to get his boss killed. So Daniel was cunning. Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, when he says, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents, serpents and innocent as doves. So be cunning. Be faithful. Trust God. Remember the great lesson of this story is that Daniel served a God who was in control and who could make a way when others saw no way. There's a godly sense of prayer-filled, humble, mature, wise pursuit of godliness that I have found God tends to honor. Principle four. When all else fails, courageously make your stand. Daniel's winsomeness won the day because he had earned relational equity with his boss. His plan worked. Where others just ate the food, Daniel trusted God to make a way forward that would honor God's law and God provided. Many times this will be your case, but this will be the case as you seek to honor God. Sometimes it won't. We have a few great examples of this from Daniel's own life. Later in Daniel chapter 6, Daniel finds himself in another draw the line situation. Either he stops praying to God and only prays to King Darius, or he gets fed to the lions. Consider this. Courage is always produced by faith. And faith is God confidence. Daniel chapter 6 verse 10 says, He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. He had faith in God because he personally knew God was alive. And Daniel had confidence from above and gave thanks before his God. Remember Hebrews uh, chapter 11, verse 6, where it says, And without faith, it is impossible to please him. Daniel's faith was from above. He had faith in God for good reason. God never has lost. He remains undefeated. He's never crashed, and he's never been overloaded. We need to have our faith focused like a laser. Here's three components you're going to need to increase your faith. First component, far too many have borrowed faith. God is your father's God, or your pastor's God, or your wife's God. What you need is God to be your God. We need to recognize that there's a relationship between the strength of our faith and personal experience with God. Second component, 
we need to recognize that there's a relationship between the strength of our faith and the size of our God. If you have little faith, then your view of God is too small. Faith places the glory, the power, and the presence of God on display for all to see. Faith says God will come through. One of the biggest obstacles to possessing lion-hearted, righteous boldness is simple. People are too big and God is too small. Fear grows when people are big and God is small. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 37 and 38 tells us, For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But conversely, faith grows when God is big and people are small. Third component. We need to shift our eyes from what threatens to destroy us to the one who promises to deliver us. The power of faith isn't your faith itself. The power of faith is in the one you believe. Focus your faith on putting your crosshairs on Christ. Christ is the power that faith draws its strength from. Faith is sight even when the lights are off. For Daniel, his faith was rewarded with influence and God's favor, insight and wisdom, and interpretation. So remember this as you go into this coming week. When you stand strong in the Lord, when you know who you are in the Lord, when you live a life that honors and glorifies him, he will bless you and he will use you. We'll close this scripture, if you would please read with me, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Let's pray. Father God, again, we just thank you for for your presence here. We thank you for the opportunity to come and, and to worship you and to glorify your name. We thank you so much for this opportunity to learn about your word, uh, to learn that you are sovereign and you are in control in all things at all times. So help us to learn that and imprint it in our hearts and use this daily in our lives in this coming week. We ask all these things in your son's precious name. Amen. Thanks so much for listening. If you would like to give to our ministry, please check out our website at lewistonocc.org. And don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe to this podcast, as well as our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram, so you're always up to date with what's going on here at Orchards Community Church. Take care, and God bless.